Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by an old friend, Shep Melnick. I shouldn't say old, just a friend, Shep Melnick. <laughs> We've known each other since grad school, so that's a, that's a bit of a long time um, at this stage in our lives. Uh, but uh, Shep is the Tip O'Neill Professor of Political Science at Boston College, a uh, very distinguished student of American politics and government, institutions, legislation, bureaucracy, uh, and we're going to talk today about Title IX, about which Shep wrote a very fine book, what, two, three years ago, The Transformation of Title IX. And I guess you have a book forthcoming also on school desegregation next year, I think. So those are both very interesting topics of, in their own right, substantively, and of course, case studies in uh, legislation, implementation, bureaucracy, the courts. And so I, I hope we can use this discussion of Title IX to kind of shed some light on sort of how American government works more broadly, as well as the very interesting topics raised by Title IX. So Shep, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, uh, and let's, let's, let's get to it. I, I really look forward to this discussion. So the 50 year saga of, of, of I guess it's almost 50 years of, of Title IX and give people some sense. Well, so what is Title IX? What is Title IX, Title IX of? <laughs> you know, everyone talks about Title right. IX without ever thinking like, what, what piece of legislation is that actually the ninth title of? So give a little, give a little history of how we got from, from there to here. Sure, it really is a great example of how American politics works. Um, Title IX was an insignificant part of uh, the 1972 Omnibus Education Amendments. What can be more boring than that? Right. Um, it was added um, on the House, in the House committee and then on the Senate floor with virtually no debate. Um, it simply says that in any program for education that receives federal funds, uh, uh, those programs cannot discriminate or exclude on the basis of sex. Uh, it was modeled on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, a uh, very important part of the Civil Rights Act that said that any uh, recipient of federal funds uh, cannot discriminate on the basis of race. That was important for school desegregation. Um, the sponsor of Title IX in the House, Representative Edith Green, wanted to add sex to Title VI um, to uh, say that there should not be any discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded program. But at that time, uh, busing was such a hot issue that civil rights groups didn't want to bring Title VI to the floor. Uh, so they added um, a similar provision to these education amendments that were wending their way through. Um, in the Senate, um, Senator uh, Bayh added it on a floor amendment and basically says, we just passed this, the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, so it shouldn't be very controversial to say you can't discriminate on basis of sex in federally funded programs. So it sailed through. Um, it wasn't actually, a big partisan debate or anything like that. No, the only, only thing, well, I'll, I'll say two things that were um, a bit of debate. In the House, the question was, should this apply to private undergraduate schools? And they carved out an exception to saying that private undergraduate schools can discriminate on the basis of sex. That's why you have single sex schools like Wellesley or Mount Holyoke. Um, we used to, there, there were a few all men schools that survived for a while, but basically those are, are gone. Um, and in the, the Senate, there were a few, there was a little bit of discussion about football. Do we have to have uh, co-ed football teams? Do we have to have uh, co-ed locker rooms? And people joked about it and said, well, of course not. That, that would be silly. Uh, but of course, uh, sports did become a major issue very quickly. But one thing I'll point out about uh, the, the very brief debate about Title IX was that um, it, was, it was modeled on race. But there was immediately a recognition that race and sex were a little bit different. So that we allowed single sex colleges in a way that we would not have allowed single sex, uh, single race schools. Um, and that difference between race and sex emerged quite quickly in the athletic area. I just know one other thing about how uh, little noted it was. When President Nixon signed the legislation, he didn't mention Title IX. And when the New York Times uh, story covering the, the legislation was written, it didn't say a word about Title IX. Hmm. So not a lot of debate. 
And so for people our age, Title Online first becomes famous. Now I think it's famous because of, uh, of free speech on campuses and sexual mm -hmm. uh, harassment and, and uh, the Obama administration's uh, letters and regulations and Trump. And we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. But for people our age, it first becomes famous because of the athletics, mm -hmm. right? I, I personally, people say Title IX. I'm struck with people who are 20 years younger, 30 years younger, say Title IX. Maybe they think a little more about the fights over uh, sort of free speech on campus or, mm -hmm. or, or if you put it the other side, I don't know what, gender equity on campus or something. But, mm -hmm. but uh, for us, it was, it was the equalization of funding for sports. And how did that just, how did that happen? Or when did that happen? Was that right away or did that take a while or? Pretty soon. Um, the, the identification of Title IX with sports was pretty uh, extensive. I know there is a very glossy uh, catalog for women's sports apparel that's called Title IX, which I think is probably the only um, clothing line that's, that's named after a section of the U.S. code. Right. But, uh, right, it became uh, controversial quite quickly because uh, – the, the way in which we handled most Title IX issues, which is to say women should have equal opportunity, women should not be barred, that was easy and that was really in, remarkably successful. The problem with um, athletics is that you can't simply say, okay, we're gonna allow women to compete for men's teams. Um, equality really re required separate but equal. Um, again, the difference between sex and race. So then the question is, what is equal? Right. Um, is it equal funding? Is it equal number of teams? Um, and in that regard, football really did become a major problem uh, at the college level because there are so many uh, people, on, guys on a football team. You know, you, you, know, you have uh, uh, offense, defense, special teams, injuries, uh, replacement for linebackers, uh, so much uh, so many people and so much money, but of course they also make a lot of money. So how do you right. put that in? When the uh, Department of HEW wrote regulations in 1975, um, Casper Weinberger was uh, Secretary of HEW at that time. And he said, never before did I realize that the most pressing issue in American politics was college athletics. He was really irritated by the pressure he was getting from all sides. And so they, they tried to come up with some wishy-washy regulations that say, well, you have to have equal access, but you don't have to have equal funding. Um, these are things should be equal, but they really didn't say much about um, what teams should be offered and um, how the, the uh, money issue would be resolved. Uh, so I guess that's what I, colleges yeah. could chug along with their 20 men's sports teams and six women's sports right. teams which are not nearly as well funded partly because they don't some some cases they don't need the funding it's not as expensive a sport but in other yeah. cases they exactly are kind of second class citizens in a way and when mm -hmm. is that but that changes right that, that changed pretty fast well i mean uh, uh, part of the story here is how many different parts there are to the story there are long delays and then there are um interpretations and court decisions um the first big change came um, in 1979 under the Carter administration. Carter administration was getting a lot of pressure from women's groups to be uh, more uh, activist in this regard. Colleges were demanding more guidance on what they were expected to do. So in 1979, um, the Carter administration issued not a regulation, but an interpretation of the previous regulation that in ambiguous ways, indicated that the standard would be um, what's often called parity. That is the number of varsity sports should reflect the male-female ratio of the student body. Um, so if a school wa was 50% uh, female, 50% of the varsity slots should be reserved for females. And I, one thing, I do, the, in a way, I don't think that anyone understood the importance of it. The focus immediately became on varsity sports. Yeah, I'm critical of this because I think, you know, maybe women have different sets of interests. Maybe they're more interested in intramurals. Maybe they're more interested in fitness. But the focus became almost exclusively on varsity sports. Easiest thing so, to measure, I guess, and the most visible thing. The right? mo I think that's, I think what you just said is right, that the most visible. Um, and if you view one of the purposes of Title IX is breaking down old stereotypes, the visibility of college sports became crucial to many of the advocacy groups. Um, so there were these 
interpretations that had no explanation. Um, and really didn't become important for over a decade because meanwhile, the Supreme Court had issued uh, a famous decision called the Grove City decision, saying that Title IX and Title VI only apply to the particular program getting funding. And athletics doesn't get funding. Um, so for about a decade- From the federal government, yeah. For the federal government, right. Um, so for about a decade, there was very little federal activity until Congress passed the so-called Grove City Bill over President Reagan's veto, um, basically saying that if any part of the university receives federal funds, everything in it is covered by Title IX and Title VI. So then the process um, really started to take off, especially because of a crucial uh, lower court decision by the First Circuit that said basically this parity standard you have to have the number of slots uh, on varsity teams to reflect the ratio of male to female students. That is the standards you must all work toward. Wow. So, so you kind of go from Congress to regulations, to interpretations, to court decisions about the interpretations. And then, um, uh, then the new Department of Education built upon that say, oh yeah, it equals scholarships too. And here's how we're gonna measure it. So this is a process I call institutional leapfrogging, where each one, each institution builds on the initiatives of the other, and you end up with something that's quite different with what you started with. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because, and it's not necessarily the, the most formal or, or most senior part of each institution. So it can be a letter of interpretation, not an actual regulation. I suppose one reason for that is that regs have a whole process they have to go through under the Administrative Procedure Act. And mm -hmm. but you can just issue a letter. And of course, it's sort of, it's not therefore scrutinized quite in the same way. But mm -hmm. of course, it could still have the same effect if some college doesn't want to get on the wrong side of, of the Office of Civil Rights and, and uh, the Department of Education, I suppose. And, and same with the lower court making a decision if it's not a, overturned by the Supreme Court, it becomes mm -hmm. de facto, I guess, the law of the land, especially if the general sentiment and mood is going in that direction, right? I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A couple of things. Uh, one is the Supreme Court has never said anything about athletics in Title IX, <laughs> ever. Um, the, the crucial decision was a First Circuit decision. And as you indicated, other courts followed that. So that was the end of the issue. The other thing I'd mentioned uh, related to what you just said about uh, rulemaking is that uh, there have only been two major rulemaking procedures under the Administrative Procedure Act in the 50 years of Title IX. That was 1975, and then in 2020 with the Trump administration's regulations on uh, sexual harassment. And all of the other time, they skirted um, the, the Administrative Procedures Notice and Combat Rulemaking by interpretations, guidance documents, and more recently, the so-called Dear Colleague letters. They're all issued unilaterally, and um, they can, that can be done quickly without much review, without much public participation. But of course, they can also be overturned the same way. And when does the um, sort of the saga of when do things get pretty well settled in terms of Title IX and athletics? Is that sort of, I have a vague impression by about 2000, that's kind of, I mean, people, colleges are pretty much yeah. following this regulation or the guidance and and the, the brouhaha dies down because you have some kind of parity. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Or I mean, I don't yeah, know what it is. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, the courts were pretty much in agreement um, on the parity standard, or at least working towards the parity standard. The, the George W. Bush administration tried to relax it um, when they, they were faced a lot of uh, uh, concerns, especially uh, from members of Congress like Denny Hassert, who was very concerned about the decline of wrestling teams. Um, Don Rumsfeld actually was a former college wrestler, so he was uh, concerned about this too. Uh, so uh, George W. Bush did what presidents so often do when they face a difficult issue, appointed a commission. Uh, the commission issued recommendations that were never followed. Um, it, and I, I would say that the most important actor in defeating the Bush administration's proposals was uh, the NCAA, um, and, uh, which is ironic because in the 1970s, the NCAA was the leading opponent of applying Title IX to sports um, because they thought it was going to hurt football and men's basketball. But uh, when after they lo lost that battle, they said, well, if we can't defeat them, let's take them over. 
So basically they took over women's sports. They destroyed, which I think was a very healthy women's model of sports, um, which was not this highly competitive um, national championships. But uh, the NCAA started to sponsor these national championships, poured a lot of money into women's sports, and then became uh, committed to the expansion of women's sports. So um, they were, I, I'm not a big fan of the NCAA for many, many reasons, but I think they were the primary actors. So the, by the end of the Bush administration, I guess it's sort of settled. And, and I don't have the impression there have been huge fights about all this in the last 15 years or so. Maybe, you know, things at the margin where people complain that women's lacrosse isn't getting the same amount of money as men's lacrosse or something. Yeah, but, you know. yeah I think that's right. And I mean, partly uh, colleges are still moving towards the so-called parity, but most of them have not achieved it yet. That's interesting. Um, the, uh, the I think I mean in part because uh, when you look at um, college um, enrollment, we're we're heading towards sixty percent female, right? Um, and that's probably going to increase. Uh, the pandemic decreased the number of males, and uh, the number of females remained steady. Uh, so uh, to to meet the parity standard would take tremendous change in athletics. And it's a free country, so we can't force. Don't want to force more female college students to participate in varsity sports than male and so right. you might have an imbalance just because of free choice and yep. Yep. even if the same scholarships are being say uh, same proportion of scholarships are being offered and so forth yep. right exactly and i mean the the big player the the, the uh school that pushed against this most Interestingly, it was Brown University. Brown, usually you think of this kind of, this kind of a quite liberal school, right. but the president of Concordia was really terrific um, in saying, um, first of all, you're requiring us to spend more and more money on athletics. And why should we do that? Why don't we spend more money on science or on libraries? Um, and second, women might have a different set of interests than men. Uh, one example of this is uh, that um, when um, guys are injured, they tend to still sit on the bench, or if they're not playing much, they sit on the bench. Women have better things to do, and they go and they if they're not going to be playing, they leave the team. So how do you measure who's on the team um, if something people are not playing? So once you get into the regulatory realm, there are as, as you know, there are all of these uh, issues about perverse incentives. Um, and the details of regulation spring up. I suppose in this case, just to finish the sort of pre-Obama administration mm -hmm. side of it, the universities, of course, are on board, presumably mostly with it. I mean, despite President Brown, despite I'm sure individual you know, football coaches being unhappy, the universities are not bastions of presumably hostility to uh, you know, sort of women's aspirations in terms of mm -hmm. equality. So they probably want to cooperate. So you don't get the kind of adversarial situation you might get in other um, aspects of legislation and rulemaking where there's a ma massive interest group, I don't know, you know oil yes. and gas industry pushing back against environmental regs, which would have a different dynamic, I suppose. Is that, is that right? I mean, yeah, exactly. One, once the NCAA changed sides, um, there was really very little pushback. And it's interesting to look at who was organized. You know, as political scientists, we're always concerned about this. Who was organized? Well, um, in addition to the NCAA, there were uh, women's uh, professional athletes who really wanted schools to become farm teams for their professional leagues. There were coaches. Um, there were there were players on teams that might have been downgraded or dis disbanded. They were well organized. Uh, the, uh, the people might be more interested in playing ultimate frisbee. Not too organized. So, a classic example of the importance of organizations. Yeah, and I guess the, um, I mean, I was someone like me who's vaguely studied all this stuff at a kind of constitutionalist and maybe legalistic in retrospect, the way it all sort of seems a little wrong. You know, this thing that wasn't intended to do this. It's, it's, a, it's a letter, not a, not a formal regulatory process. Why mm -hmm. is one court decision driving everything? Um, but I suppose one could make it, and I'm curious what you think of this argument. Someone made this to me when we were just chatting about this. I was saying I was going to do this conversation with you that we could do ago. Uh, well, but in a certain conservative way, little c conservative, Burkean conservative way, mm -hmm. isn't this kind of the way you'd expect it to work? There'll be, mm -hmm. it's sort of complicated. It's sort of messy. Mm -hmm. 
there isn't this clarity of, you know, this law is passed with a fantastic, you know, uh, cl fantastically clear set of debates in Congress and the intent of the of the of the legislators and there's not one court decision laying it all out it's kind of incremental it's kind of uh you know, it goes in a slightly haphazard way it's in accord with the spirit of the times we haven't ended up in a terrible situation that i mean despite your qualms about the you know the way in which women's college sports has been transformed people seem okay with it so to speak and maybe it's sort of the system the american political system working in a kind of okay, Burkean way, if not, you know, in accord with every professor of administrative law or every political scientist who wants to see super clarity in terms of our legislative procedure. What do you, what do you think of that argument? Sure. Well, I mean, in some ways it's classic uh, incrementalism, right? It's uh, that, uh, that we learned from Aaron Waldowski, there are certain advantages of incrementalism. I guess where, where I would uh, differ a bit is the that there wasn't very much thought, number one, to alternatives, to costs. Um, as you point out, there were not many people um, pushing back. Um, and I think that had a couple of unfortunate consequences. And I'll point out too. One is the fact that the emphasis is so much on one tiny part of the issue, which was um, varsity sports, rather than saying, well, what are the general um, interests and abilities of women that might not be the same as men. There was kind of a, this rigid view that, that, we, that equality required that we treat them as if they were interchangeable. Um, and the other thing, which uh, you know, I, I will give the Obama administration some credit for this, um, the emphasis was so much on college sports that they didn't pay very much attention to elementary and high school. Hmm. Um, the Obama administration did pay some- And the act itself applies to, to all of them. I, didn't, I actually didn't even know that. I kind of assumed yeah. it was just higher education, but that's what you always hear right. about, right? Oh. Yeah. I mean, it is remarkable that, um, I mean, the, within element, especially secondary school and high school, um, there are millions and millions of more women. Um, there are the disparities between male and female at the high school level is really dramatic. That um, the, we... There's a lot of evidence that the, the schools in which the disparities are greatest are those in which there are a large number of minority students. And if we want to deal with a problem of obesity and physical inactivity, that's where you really should start. We, you should mm -hmm. start there and making sure women have up, girls at that level have opportunities there, rather than focusing on the tiny, tiny number of varsity athletes at the college level. So I, I, I do give the uh, Obama administration credit for starting to refocus some of the effort at the high school level. Uh, on the sports uh, yes. stuff. Yes. Well, let's get to the Obama administration, because okay. in the last decade, the, a lot of the controversy about Title IX has not been on sports, but it's been on, uh, well, tell us what it's been on and how it came about. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just start with a little bit. When I started writing about Title IX, it was um, uh, about 2010. Um, and I, I was going to write a short chapter on this in a larger book on the civil rights state. And then the sexual harassment stuff exploded hmm. um, and became uh, more and more controversial. The regulations became expanded dramatically. And then on top of that, uh, in the last year of the Obama administration, they issued these regulations about transgender rights. Uh, so the remarkable expansion of what Title IX was about. Um, and here again, you see the kind of incremental uh, institutional leapfrogging that was uh, true in sports. So uh, you might start with the question, why is sexual harassment, why is sexual misconduct discriminatory? Um, it's not clear why um, sexual harassment is covered under Title IX. Um, it's presumably covered was, under other... Yeah. rules and regulations, either of colleges and universities or of mm -hmm. state law, right, or federal law, I suppose. Right. And, and, uh, and just as importantly, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, it does bar discrimination on the basis of sex. So to make a very long story short, basically, um, uh, the argument was, well, racial harassment, if, if you are harassing people uh, with racist comments and making them very uncomfortable in the workplace, and the, the employer does nothing about that, 
that's a very good case for saying that's racial discrimination because you're really forcing minorities out because of the way people are behaving towards them. Um, and then, so you could make a similar argument about, about employment, about sex. If people are making, uh, say women shouldn't be here, you know, get out of here, this is not a job for women and the employers tolerate that, then you can see why that would be considered discrimination. But of course, what we now mean by sexual harassment um, is much broader than that. And it has to do with this odd combination of maybe, you know, anti uh, women sentiment, but also attraction um, because you're attracted to a particular woman or you, you're, you're exploiting her because you're attracted to her. Um, so the, the dynamic is different, but um, the, the, the same rules were applied. Um, and they were applied, most importantly, in under Title VII about employment, by midnight regulation just before uh, Reagan administration took office in 1981 from the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, you know, moments before the inauguration. Those regulations actually survived the Reagan administration. Um, and um, they became relatively well established in the employment context. Again, so this, is, this of, is under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It is not a, on the edge, not Title IX, but it exactly. establishes the predicate for how we think about sexual harassment and what's wrong with it. Exactly. Yeah, it, we, we see kind of a number of trans, uh, uh, transfers from race to sex, from employment to education, and then from elementary and high schools to college. So yeah. all of you, the incremental growth goes along this line. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court basically accepted uh, the, this uh, interpretation of Title VII and issued uh, some, I think, pretty um, reasonable uh, rules about liability that ended a lot of the controversy there. Um, and then the question was, well, how would this apply in the educational context? Um, and uh, I, this get, it gets a little more complicated here, but it leads to something about the Trump administration, which was that the, the Supreme Court here did enter the picture. Um, and they said, well, yes, sexual harassment is a violation of Title IX, but under only very limited circumstances. They said a school has to have actual knowledge of the harassment. And they have to be deliberately indifferent. So that's a very, very lenient. And when is this around? This this, this was 98 and, nine, and 99. So, okay. So, um, and that was quite different from the guidance that um, the Office for Civil Rights and Department of Education had been issuing. Then there was this remarkable event um, just before George H. W. George W. Bush took office, actually the day before. Um, Office of Civil Rights issued another set of midnight regulations saying, we're not going to follow the Supreme Court hmm. um, because we think they were too lenient. Um, and uh, uh, we are going to, to stick by our previous regulations that made schools much more responsible for various types of sexual misconduct taking place in schools. Now, what's interesting about that is that they made an argument which was kind of legally kind of clever, but practically unworkable. And the, it was legally clever because they said, well, the Supreme Court just issued rules about liability in court. And we're setting administrative rules about what you have to do to uh, get federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, but then the problem was that under uh, Title IX, the total number of times that the federal government has used the funding cutoff to enforce its regulation is zero. Mm -hmm. It has never done it. It always threatens it. It never does it. It relied on court and court enforcement through private rights of action. But if so an individual would sue that she had been harassed or whatever, and, and that that exactly. was in effect the the way in which Title IX was enforced. Exactly right. A private suit initially could be for an injunction, but in a, in a case that came before the Supreme Court, they said you can also get money damages. Um, this is a good case example of when a Supreme Court case involved really grotesque misconduct by a student. And I think the Supreme Court said, this is really awful. We shouldn't allow uh, this to go on. So we're going to allow money damages. Um, so that was a pretty big incentive for um, schools to comply because they were facing possibly million dollars uh, uh, liability. 
um, if they didn't follow OCR regulations. But now the Supreme Court has said, no, under liability law, it's much more limited. So there was no obvious way for the Office for Civil Rights to enforce these regulations. Um, and during the George W. Bush administration, they basically uh, uh, didn't do anything to enforce those uh, midnight guidelines. I um, mean, it wasn't until really two years into the Obama administration that began to change. And, and why does the Obama, so this is when the Obama administration sort of famously takes up this cause, I guess, yes. 2011. And, and why is that? And, and sure. is there pressure to do it? Or is it generated well, I, by activists, administrators yeah. who think they're doing the right thing? Or Right. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of reasons. Um, in 2010, um, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan um, went to Selma, Alabama and said, we haven't been doing enough to enforce civil rights laws in education. I think they were getting a lot of pushback um, uh, from civil rights groups. Um, the Obama administration had been pretty centrist in education policy uh, to that point. And I think some on the, the progressive wing were getting a little um, uneasy or a little uh, anxious to do further. Another key factor, which I think became, has become increasingly important, is Joe Biden. Joe Biden was the sponsor of the Violence Against Women's Act in the 1990s. Um, he in, in the first, uh, second lady, Jill Biden, were very invested in this issue. Um, they frequently spoke about it. And so the White House was really pushing this, especially the, the Bidens. Um, and there was a lot of support for this in the Office of, for Civil Rights. Uh, women's groups were really pushing it. Um, there was a whole new generation of what were called survivor groups on campus. Um, that were very active. The press was really picking up on this. Um, so all of a sudden there was tremendous political interest and political pressure. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights was quite quite um, happy to oblige um, and just kind of lay out the general groundwork. Um, in 2011, uh, they issued a, a famous Dear Colleague letter, uh, basically saying, here, here's the new regime. Who were the, coll the colleagues to whom this was addressed were right. administrators uh, of, in universities? Or? Right, yeah. Well, it, um, or is it presidents? Uh, administrators in universities, but also every secondary and primary school in the country. Oh, wow. So, you know, uh, there are 14,000 public school districts in this country. Uh, so it went to them and went to every public and private university. Um, right. Uh, the idea that um, somehow uh, the Office for Civil Rights is my colleague <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> as a little bit um, dubious and somewhat offensive. Um, of course, um, for people who worked in Congress, you know that this term actually came from uh, congressmen and senators sending around a letter, dear colleague, would you co-sponsor this? Right. Um, there they were equals, but not here. Um, uh, it was very lengthy and it really took um, a different approach to the, the whole problem. The, the previous approach had been um, based on the idea of legal liability, that schools were liable for the misconduct of what were seen to be a few bad apples, you know, a few um, misbehaving people, almost entirely men, and they had to be investigated and disciplined or po possibly expelled. But the new regulations- These would be different. either students or faculty or administrators. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I just say that the early case that came before the Supreme Court, that really got the Supreme Court justifiably outraged, was misbehavior by teachers against students, often underage students. So this was the criminal activity. Um, but of course, then it morphed much more into concern, not about misconduct by teachers, administrators, but by fellow students. Um, because the underlying understanding that was repeated in White House reports and White House statements was that there was a rape culture on campus and that we had to take dramatic action to undo this rape culture, which meant um, not only taking very serious steps to investigate, um, but to have extensive training um, and to figure out you've got to change the entire culture of colleges. That's pretty extreme, um, pretty demanding. And that was really lay at the heart of the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. And then um, 2014, a over 50 page so-called questions and answers. 
basically, this is how exactly you have to do this. This is what has the procedure for investigating. This is the timeline. Here are the 20 remedial steps that you have to take uh, to help people who have suffered from uh, sexual misconduct. Here is the type of training you have to do to really make remake the entire apparatus for dealing with these issues on campus. And then a, a third dear colleague letter saying, well, here's how you have to structure the Title IX office. And I think for, for students of bureaucracy, it's interesting. What they were trying to do was to build parallel bureaucracies um, kind of uh, within the university events to, to make sure that the very close connections between the Office for Civil Rights um, and college administrators. And my impression was even in the, with the first letter in 2011, though, they're pushing a bit on an, uh, on an open door in the sense that people who work in these kinds of jobs in yes. universities, and I'm not casting aspersions here, just really making an analytical point, probably are sort of sympathetic to this anyway. Right. That's why they work there and they're trying to do good and change the culture of the universities and right. what they think is a good way. And, and OCR turns out to be an ally. The Office of Civil Rights is an sure. ally in this. So again, it's not your classic interest group. You know, as I say, the, the oil companies fighting back against the <laughs> EPA reg or, you know, the banks in a tug of war with the, um, you know, the con control of the currency or, or, or treasury department or something. It, 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 there's a kind of, I mean, people who are hostile to this would say kind of collusion. People who are not so hostile would simply say, well, they, they had a similar analysis or at least, and it was fine. But either way, it's, it does seem like it went pretty, went through pretty quickly without much pushback, right? Am I wrong? I and mean, there was some public outcry, but it, I feel like in the actual universities, they were perfectly, mostly pretty happy to put into place these new yeah. procedures. Yeah, I think that's right. And there's a strange disconnect between the, the, the rationale for the extensive regulations was that universities were so complicit in rape culture um, that they really had to be forced to do all of these things. And, but as you pointed out, most universities were quite happy to do it. Um, they were sympathetic. I mean, who, who wants to con condone sexual misconduct? Um, that uh, especially in the Title IX offices, there was a lot of support for this. And I, one of the, I make the general point that very frequently within universities, um, we are told, we the faculty are told, well, the federal government requires us to do this. And if you don't comply with this, we're going to lose all our federal funding. Well, of course, that's ridiculous about losing federal funding. And usually the university administrators are cranking up what is required. Um, so I, for all faculty out there, I'd say, don't give in to being told that the federal government requires all this stuff because usually they don't. Uh, but the administrators have their own uh, cloud over the faculty. So I, I suppose if you're an administrator, I mean, it's safer to go ahead and do this. Who wants to fight about this? You just want to kind of, I mean, you want to do the right thing, obviously, for your students and for people, who, employees and faculty. You also want do not want to scandal your place or yes. bad publicity. And so you go ahead and if you've dotted every I and crossed every T, and again, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, maybe this is a good thing. This is the way mm -hmm. compliance with the law often works. I mean, you are safer than if you objected to this or that, which seems excessive in terms of, I don't know, making everyone take a course every year about, you know, when they do half an hour on a computer to make mm -hmm. sure they're not they understand the rules or whatever. And so I, I you can sort of see how it yeah. As I say, given the absence of a pushback, how quickly this gets institutionalized. I guess it does pretty fast, right? I mean, given that it's a dear colleague letter in 2011. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, a lot of these administrators are already there. And I've got to think a lot of colleges and universities are sort of halfway or two thirds of the way there on their own. Is that right? I mean, how much? Yeah, that, that's generally true. But I would add one thing, which is I, I mentioned the enforcement difficulty previously. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights on, in the Obama administration came up with, I think, a very bureaucratically clever way of dealing with that problem, which is that um, previously, if there was an investigation of a college, they would only make it public when an agreement had been reached. But they decided to publicize the investigations from the beginning here um, and to go after some high profile schools. Um, and these, these investigations lasted months and months, and some of them many years. Um, and they were very kind of expensive to kind of keep producing all of these documents. It was very embarrassing for schools. And as you point out, um, schools didn't want to be look like that they were condoning sexual misconduct, obviously. 
Um, so the, the pressure came from the investigations and schools had a very strong incentive to agree to what OCR said. And then they would, they would sign these very extensive compliance agreements. Um, and in one famous case involving Tufts, they agreed to a compliance agreement. Then the president read it and said, well, man, I can't agree to all this stuff because basically this says that we're gonna have OCR oversight for year after year after year. But then um, uh, OCR said, well, okay, then we'll just continue the investigation. And he finally said, okay, I give up. And so the, the, if someone is charged with something, a faculty member or a student or an administrator, he, usually it's a he, so I'll just say his name is, is public from the beginning it, under this system? Well, not necessarily the individual, not the individuals, but the fact that um, they have all of these cases pending, that uh, they have all these complaints. Uh, so that, that level and the fact that they are under scrutiny itself was pretty embarrassing. Schools. And I guess there's no law against the complainant making the complaint public if she wish, he or she wishes. So, I mean, well, I have the vague impression that, yeah. that we suddenly started hearing about a lot of individual cases with individual yes. names in that period. Is that yes. not right? Or Yes. Um, the, there is an asymmetry on the release of information. Um, and a good example is the, the Columbia University mattress girl um, who basically uh, went to the press about these claims of sexual misconduct, which were found to be unfounded by Columbia. Um, but she kept making claims that, that this was serious misconduct. The school could not respond because of the Buckley Amendment and because of other privacy rules. So part of the press um, is about charges that can't be rebutted by the schools, uh, which, which is a, a I, I think a skewed public understanding of these issues. One thing I'd say that one of the, where the schools did face a lot of pushback eventually was from suits brought by um, almost always guys who were suspended or expelled. And they brought due process claims in federal court and colleges started to lose more suits than ever before. Right. Colleges usually win suits against them, but they lost a lot of these due process suits. And one of the reasons for that is because the Office for Civil Rights has been pushing schools to uh, institute the so-called single investigator model, which said basically you, got, you appoint a single investigator model appointed by the Title IX officer, that that person would investigate, determine guilt or innocence, and then recommend a punishment um, and that decision on guilt or innocence could not be challenged under almost any circumstances. So it really was a kind of a grand inquisitor. Um, mm -hmm. And the Title IX officers at that time had a very strong incentive to make sure that they showed they're really tough on uh, sexual misconduct. So that type of uh, single investigative model got a lot of pushback from legal groups, including the ABA, from uh, uh, American Association of University Professors um, and from the, from the federal courts. And that was the major source of concern among colleges that maybe we shouldn't do this. But certainly in sort of the public discourse, especially among conservative or not even that conservative, but conservative types plus free speech types, I would say, and due mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. types. By, I'd say by, what, 2015, 16, there's a, quite a lot of concern yes. um, about this thing is sort of out of control. There really isn't, it's not fair uh, to the people who are accused. Uh, it's sliding over their due process concerns. And also, I, maybe you can explain this a bit, even concerns about speech on campus yes. and yeah. what, what would have thought was protected speech, uh, not being so protected. And mm -hmm. so to talk a little about where we were by sort of yeah. 2015, 16, both in terms of what the politics of it, uh, but also the reality. I and mean, maybe the right. politics exaggerated the reality. I don't know, I'm sure it did yeah. somewhat. Well, you're right. The question is, why was there pushback eventually on this when there wasn't pushback on athletics? Um, and the two main issues were due process and freedom of speech. Um, the pushback was pretty extensive. Actually, there was a whole section of the 2016 Republican platform on Title IX. Um, and the, uh, of the due process, there were a lot of, um, I think, very serious cases of people being railroaded. 
Um, uh, much of this was documented by Stuart Taylor um, uh, and, and his uh, colleague. Um, and um, the, there's an organization that um, grew up among parents to support um, these uh, accused students. Um, and when these cases came to light, the, the difficulties of the single investigative model and the, and the fact you didn't often didn't have hearings and you didn't have cross-examination, that really came to light. I, I think that was extremely serious. Um, the other was the free speech issue because the definition of speech in these dear colleague letters was, you know, uh, misconduct was um, very broad. It, it involved any, any what they called um, uh, verbal conduct. I love that term, verbal conduct, which means speech. <laughs> um, that could be online, that doesn't have to be directed against any individual. Um, that can involve um, perpetuating stereotypes. Um, so the definition was extremely broad. And the classic case here is Laura, Laura Kipnis in Northwestern, who wrote an article in that hotbed of inflammatory journalism, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and she said, I think we've gone too far in limiting sexual relations between faculty and grad students. You know, I disagree with that, but you know, certainly a respectable point of view. And for that, there were complaints about sexual harassment. Um, and she was subject to two very lengthy investigations um, by uh, Northwestern University um, for political speech. Um, and there were, this, there were a number of other instances of- And this, this was really just an opinion based on- Yeah. Uh, it wasn't defending some colleague who'd done something terrible or- no. Not that that would necessarily be wrong either, presumably there's free speech right. on that yeah. too, but, but it was yeah, more it was just, just an a, opinion. a general opinion going forward of what, how campuses would work if we were hypersensitive to this particular form of, if we assumed any such relationship was a, a unequal water or harassment or so forth. Right. Right. Exactly, right. And, and I think this is based on the idea that I write about in my book, which is that the purpose of Title IX had become trying to um, destroy all stereotypes based on gender. Um, and if that's the underlying purpose, then if you engage in stereotypical thinking, according to some of the inquisitors, then that's a violation of Title IX, which is, I think, quite a dangerous idea. Um, and there were other instances in which um, administrators um, used Title IX um, sexual harassment to basically get rid of people they didn't like. Um, there's a famous case in Louisiana about this uh, uh, education professor who had irritated state legislators, um, and they uh, fired her because they said she used salty language in class, which was um, inappropriate in mixed company. You know, <laughs> absurd, but they fired her on the basis of that. So it really did put uh, a weapon in the hands of administrators who wanted to get rid of people that they found um, troublesome. And my impression is that I think Laura Kiptis is reasonably liberal politically and sort of yes. feminist. In fact, mm -hmm. the people like her being uh, unjustly sort of persecuted really and at some cost to their careers and their time. And I guess, I guess maybe not direct expenses, but certainly uh, time and effort and reputation. And then, and liberal judges too, I think finding against the colleges and universities in many cases, it wasn't just a bunch of, there were no Trump appointees on the court after yes. all at this point, most of them, presumably at least half, probably more of the judges were Clinton or Obama appointees by, mm -hmm. by 2012, 2013, 14, 15. I have the sense that sort of made it much more respectable to say, well, this is a little out of control. It's not just a bunch of Neanderthal, you know, old professors who liked preying on grad students, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so forth, of whom there are right. some, of course. Yeah, absolutely right. And one of the most outspoken um, opponents of these regulations was Dean Strausen, the former director of the ACLU. Um, a, a lot of civil libertarians were very concerned about this. Um, and it's interesting. So the, the Trump administration in 2020 um, substantially revised those. So, um, so it's just so Obama, the Obama administration doesn't react to that much. But before they leave office, they're, they're all in play. I mean, they're defending what they've done and, and everything's in place when Trump yes. takes over. Absolutely. Um, but the Republicans and, have run against this and now yes. Trump controls the administration, the government and the Republicans control Congress. And so what do they do with uh, right. 
Uh, I just say further about the Obama administration that um, the uh, Catherine Lehman, who issued the, the 2014 regulations um, when she was head of OCR in uh, the Obama administration, is the new head of OCR. And she has been very critical of the Trump regs and say, wants to go back to the Obama rules. So not only do they not change, but they they are maintaining that position to, to the present day. Um, the, the Trump administration immediately suspended the Obama guidelines. And they can do that because they were issued unilaterally. They can be suspended unilaterally. Then they went through the to a two-year notice and comment rulemaking process, which really remarkably extensive, elaborate. They received 120,000 comments on these regulations. Um, they wrote a, an explanation of the regulations, final regulations, it was 2,000 pages long. Um, I had agreed to write something for the Brookings Institution on this. And I, when I saw well, I got to read 2,000 pages of explanation, I thought, why did I agree to do this? Mm -hmm. um, but they, they did a number of things. They Most importantly, they expanded due process protections requiring hearings and cross-examination, um, not allowing single investigator. They narrowed the, the definition of what constitutes sexual harassment. They reduce the demands on training and on um, um, remedies, giving much more discretion to schools. Um, so they were quite extensive. But um, the, one of the lessons here is that when you do things, notice and comment rulemaking, it has can only be undone through notice and comment rulemaking. So the, the Biden administration hasn't done anything yet. They said, we're going to revise these, but it, it could they're going to have to rush to get this done by the end of Biden's first term. Um, and uh, the other. And you think uh, this was a pretty serious and reputable process? I mean, yes. I mean, leaving aside in a way our own one's individual views on the merits of each part of it. I mean, that they yeah. this wasn't just Trump kind of, you know, yes, taking a slashing away at stuff he didn't like or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I when I'm writing about I, since given my um, very low opinion of the Trump administration right. and the, 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 the sloppy way they did most of this stuff, this really stands out as an exception. Um, and uh, I, I so the people in the lot, education department who did this, at least, were serious and yes, knew what they were doing. And were Extre very much so. Ken Marcus, who was the assistant secretary of education, is a very thoughtful Guy, he had a lot of people in the office of legal counsel, very serious, thoughtful people. Um, and uh, it's gotten support from a lot of people, as you noted, people who are uh, libertarians, uh, some liberal Democrats who were um, skeptical of the Obama administration's regulations. Um, the other thing, not only were they very careful, but they stuck very close to the Supreme Court. I think this, they didn't diverge from the Supreme Court the way the Obama Obama administration did. And that's another reason why these regulations are going to be very difficult to overturn. Um, a number, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in a debate um, at AEI um, with supporters of these regulations. And um, uh, the, one of them had been in the Obama uh, Justice Department. He said, oh, these things are going to be overturned. And I was pretty dubious about that um, because I thought the courts would uphold it. And the four courts have heard the reviews of these regulations have all upheld them 99%. Wow. And they said so they've gone into effect. And did colleges actually change their procedures as a result? Yes. Um, I think, uh, right. Especially on requiring hearings, requiring uh, cross examination. Now, one of the complexities here is that Title IX establishes minimum requirements. Um, so, for example, um, OCR, for good reasons, said, that this doesn't, the, OC, the Title IX doesn't apply to student study abroad because it only applies to the United States. But if a school wants to extend coverage to study abroad, they can do so. Um, if they want to cover um, social clubs that are off campus uh, that are not covered by the regulations, they could. So schools have a lot of flexibility to go beyond the coverage. The one thing, the real sticking point has been the requirement of live hearings and cross-examination. And so in that respect, you, you think the situation in terms of due process and speech is, uh, is actually 
more balanced and, yes. and better than it was five years ago. Or something. Yes, I, I believe so. I think on both those regards, they're much better. Now, there can be things that are tweaked. Um, and uh, you can tweak a little bit how you conduct cross-examination. There was one part of the regulations having to do with admissibility of statements by people who are not subject to cross-examination. Now, you can kind of change the rules of evidence a bit here and there. Um, and maybe OCR will do that. But the, the bulk of the regulations, as far as narrowing the definition of what is sexual misconduct, um, more due process requirements, and of, of make, not having so, such rigid requirements about remedies and training, I think we're all beneficial. But we are not going to some kind of rollback of the whole structure. I mean, that's right. the one lesson of this, right? Once it, you, you can modify it and, and maybe that's fine it's certainly as a lesson mm -hmm. maybe that's again Berkey and the way things work and now we have mm -hmm. a more reasonable structure than we had maybe five or six years ago but mm -hmm. the notion that why are we doing this in the first place or colleges should be free to run themselves and that, that's kind of out the window i guess right yeah well it is kind of interesting the way in which once these things become established you can tweak things for better or for worse but the basic structure remains in place i'll just uh there was uh one uh in the 1980s, when Robert Bork was on uh, the DC circuit, he faced one of the cases involving uh, Title IX and um, actually Title VII and sexual harassment. And he pointed out this odd thing that, we, that uh, sexual misconduct is considered discriminatory because um, the, the, the aggressors discriminate on the basis of sex. So a heterosexual man will target a woman, a uh, heterosexual woman will uh, target a man, uh, a, a gay man will target another man. But Bork said, well, what about a bisexual offender? He is literally uh, not discriminating at all. So it seems that he would not be covered, which is a bizarre thing. And so Congress couldn't possibly have meant this. Um, but once it became established, even uh, you know, Scalia basically expanded the regime a little bit, an important decision. Um, and no one looks back and say, what are the foundations of this? Um, you just take it for granted, which, you know, there is a certain amount of stability is probably a good thing. And do most did most administrators and faculty who were sort of aware of what was going on in this area, were they OK with the ultimately with the Trump administration changes? Did they resist much? Did they just think, well, we don't have much choice and so we'll go along and how much of a pushback? I yeah. guess this gets to the question of what the Biden administration might do. Are they facing pressure from uh activist groups feminist groups and others to sort of got to roll these back or are people mm -hmm. looking around bc and harvard and ucla and saying i don't know the status quo is yeah. fair enough I, th I think schools are saying the latter um i think they're a little bit relieved because they're very afraid they're caught between the demands of the courts and due process and ocr so i think that yeah they want certainty um, and I think they figure they can work with these regulations. The opposition is coming from so-called survivor groups. Um, uh, and uh, so far, Democrats in Congress often go along with this. I'm kind of surprised in which there hasn't been more pushback in Congress among Democrats. Um, pushback against? Uh, against the Trump administration. Yeah, I was sort of, this is not like, one doesn't, I mean, I don't follow this stuff, this issue closely, but I mean, as someone who follows general politics somewhat, I, I don't hear a lot about this. You think yeah. this, you know, this is not like routinely cited as an outrage that must be remedied yeah. yesterday or something. Yeah, when they first came out, there was this, there were, you know, all of these outraged tweets. But um, I, I think a sign of the, the lack of enthusiasm for making change is the fact that so far, the Office for Civil Rights hasn't done much. Yeah. Um, they said we, we, we need to change these, but they haven't done much. Um, I'm sure they can come up with some things that will please some of their supporters. It might improve it a bit. I don't foresee a big change. And how important are the courts? It seems like the courts, just to now to draw out some of the implications of the kind of story you've told so well, I think so mm -hmm. interestingly. That's like the courts resisting it and insisting on a certain amount of due process would, was an important, would change the balance of power in this whole political struggle. Is that right? Exactly, um, because uh, the, the schools face potentially very large damage suits. So I think what's happening in a lot of schools, you might have a more activist Title IX office, but meanwhile you've got the Office of General Counsel saying, "Man, we don't want to get sued." Um, so uh, you got that internal battle. But I also think just the courts finding on behalf of the plaintiffs in so many of these cases 
meant from a public opinion point of view, someone like me who wasn't violent, not, I'm not on campus, I'm not a professor, except did a tiny bit, uh, for, you know, one or two courses in the last few years, uh, and had to take my little training on this and all that, most of which I found pretty objectionable, honestly, and uh, some of it, some useful reminders of how one should behave. But, um, but anyway, I do think the fact that the courts kept finding for the plaintiffs make people think on the outside, maybe members of Congress as well, is, geez, this is not, you know, this isn't good. I mean, so maybe the, the restoring of the balance was some balance was useful. Yeah, exactly. I, I, um, a good indication of the way in which um, the courts can affect public opinion. There was a case against Brandeis, my old uh, employer, um, where Brandeis really acted quite egregiously. Um, yeah. And and um, the, the district court judge said that this looks more like Salem during the witch trials than Boston in the 21st century. And I think statements like that tend to and get reported. as egregiously not giving due process to uh, someone who was accused of something. Absolutely. And actually, in this case, it was a, it was a gay man um, who uh, was accused of, of misconduct against another gay man, and I think quite unfairly accused of misconduct. Hmm. Interesting. So we have the Biden administration in office for almost a year now, um, and nothing really much yet has happened. I mean, so far as you can, as one can tell, I mean, they may be planning to do some stuff, I suppose, but, and not much congressional. I mean, again, pandemic has, of course, slowed down a lot of things. All this. Yeah. I don't have the feeling they've been, if there have been hearings even on this and by the relevant congressional committees or? Um, as far as I know, there have been no congressional hearings. A couple of things. Um, one is that the Office for Civil Rights did issue a guidance letter basically saying, even under the old, the Trump uh, rules, here, here are the areas of discretion that schools have. Um, you know, I thought that was quite accurate. It was fair. Here are the things you can do under the existing regulations. Um, they did have um, a, a public hearing on what could be done uh, to amend the regulations, but they haven't gone to the point yet of putting a proposal um, on uh, changing the regulations. And the, it'll take a couple of years even after you get the proposal. Where Congress did have some ability to step in was in the nomination of Catherine Lehman to be returned to the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and the, the uh, Senate committee um, split 50-50 um, and, uh, on whether she her nomination should be confirmed. And they then sent it to the floor. Schumer decided to, to bring it up. And um, by with Vice President Harris casting the deciding vote, she was confirmed. Um, but obviously there was united Republican opposition. And one of the reasons there was so much opposition to her, I should admit that Peter Schuck and I actually wrote an um, editorial about this and saying that Congress should pay attention to the fact that she has was, I think, quite slippery about the status of these informal guidelines. At one point, she said um, that they are binding law. Uh, at another point, she said, well, not they're, they're, maybe they're not binding law, but we're going to enforce them anyway. Um, when Senator Alexander said, well, why, do, why are these binding law? She had the temerity to say, well, because you confirm my nomination, Senator which um, led uh, Senator Alexander to say, that's a pretty weak read for, for its support of informal guidance. So the, the question of uh, the ability of administrators to rule by dear colleague letter, I think was very much in the minds of many Republicans. And I mean, altogether, I guess, then one has to say, well, a couple of things. I mean, is it, how much has it changed the character of colleges and universities to have this regime in place, which, maybe fairer and more balanced than it was five or six years ago, but it's very different from 20 years ago, let alone 40, 50 years ago. Uh, how would you assess some of the pluses and minuses? It does feel like universities maybe are sort of different from normal employers or maybe not. I mean, yeah. but, but that applying in effect, well, I don't know. It's a question. I, they seem like there's almost stricter uh, um, uh, scrutiny at universities of what's going on that it, I don't know, you know, uh, yeah. that it, magazines or foundations or other places I'm familiar with. Uh, maybe that's appropriate because you have a lot of, you know, young people who can be taken advantage of by 
mm -hmm. older people uh, upon whom they depend for uh, grades and advancement and recommendations and so forth. I don't know. How do you evaluate the whole thing? Yeah. And so, well, it, it's you raise an interesting issue. How do uh, colleges uh, differ from employers? Um, yeah. Uh, and one fact is, that, as you mentioned, you have people of different ages, right? So the one of the initial concerns was so-called quid pro quo harassment, in which a faculty member um, or a teaching assistant would basically say, have sex with me and I'll give you a better grade. Don't have sex with me and I'll fail you. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty uh, obvious misuse of authority. Um, the... Uh, and, and that's, just, that's quite similar to the employment situation where a supervisor could do that to, um, to uh, uh, an employee. That has not been very common. Um, I think that there's a sense that that type of mis misuse of power um, is very serious. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have more rules about that, um, there's more enforcement. Um, when we were at Harvard in the early 1980s, we had some pretty egregious cases of faculty misconduct. Um, and the fact that universities, first on their own and then under pressure from OCR, took a harder line against this, um, I think is beneficial, but it is not a very big part of the current controversy. The biggest part of the current controversy has been peer-on-peer -peer sexual misconduct. And of course, the big difference with schools, especially colleges, is that most employers don't have dormitories filled with thousands and thousands of employees um, who are um, exploring sex. Um, so the whole it, colleges got involved in this very murky um, realm of trying to regulate sexual relations among um, immature young adults. Um, in ways that is very hard to observe. We don't know what happened in these circumstances. Um, and I think that the one of the goals of the new regulations was basically to establish new rules about sexual relations. Um, uh, Jeannie Sub Gerson and her husband have wrote a great article at Harvard Rock you call it the sex bureaucracy, basically saying that schools have now gotten into the job of telling people what are sex, uh, proper sexual etiquette. Um, so it's a pretty fraught area of, of college in, uh, involvement. Um, and, and it's a time when um, uh, I think all the rules about sexual engagement are in play. Um, one of the, and maybe one of the beneficial consequences of this is I think it's made, especially guys, a little bit more reluctant to get involved uh, in white one night stands and um, uh, uh, have, uh, being sexually libertine. Um, but it's also led to a lot of cases of confused relationships turning into criminal or nearly criminal matters. And as a faculty member, I mean, you've talked quite a long time now. I mean, how worried should an outsider be about it, a chilling effect on speech or conversely, how relieved should one be that people couldn't get away with what they got away yeah. with 40 years ago? I mean, what's the balance? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say um, I, I am probably, I mean, I've never been one who got really deeply involved with my students, um, but I'm much more inclined these days to always keep my door open when I have students there. Um, and I think with, you know, with graduate students where you do try to have really close working relationships, um, uh, faculty members are probably a bit more careful, you know, that it, it has some advantages, has some disadvantages. Um, the, one of the areas that has really been difficult for faculty members is on reporting. Uh, because under the Obama administration, we were all mandatory reporters. And if we heard something, yeah about a possible misconduct, we were supposed to report it. Um, but often students would kind of allude to things or want to speak in private to us. Um, and that made, uh, the, uh, create some real serious difficulties and dilemmas. Um, the, the Trump administration made it less of a problem because basically they said, it's up to the students to report the misconduct. Um, and they, they're going to have, I think it's one of the advantages, they have an option. They can say, I was the product, I was the, the victim of sexual misconduct. I don't want to bring charges because 
I don't want to get this person in serious, serious trouble, but I, I need certain accommodations. I don't want to see this person. I don't want to be in the same class. Um, so they allow that um, because a lot of students, uh, even with relatively serious misconduct, don't want to bring formal charges against another student. So it inhibits their reporting. I think that we might get more um, reporting for, uh, for remedies if you can split remedies from punishment. But, uh, and also I think it makes the role of faculty members a little easier because you can actually talk with students about these things in confidence and not have a responsibility to report it. I was struck by that when I taught a little uh, reading group, but we was nonetheless uh, on the university at the, at the at Harvard this was. So they had this, we had the same responsibilities though it wasn't a for credit class, I guess, as, as anyone else. And I remember the briefing that there were six of us, it was all by Zoom, so it was a little different. Got and that part was really confusing on what your actual obviously if you see something horrible happening you should report it I don't think anyone denies that or if a student asks you to report something that he or she is too embarrassed perhaps yeah. to report himself or herself but these were so and there were cases where people wanted to get your advice on something I mean yeah. theoretical cases this didn't happen to me at least in my little uh, reading group but uh, no one came to me but um, what your obligations then were. Uh, do you, you know, do you honor the students' wishes that maybe you don't tell anyone about it? But then, do you have an obligation to it? It seemed murky at the time. Maybe this was during the transition in a way from the Obama to Trump rules. So maybe the Trump rules left it somewhat murky, or maybe Harvard, which I guess is the right, wanted to be more aggressive than the Trump rules would suggest. Mm -hmm. and, and and then there were questions of confidentiality, and it was they had worked out a pretty a system that seemed pretty reasonable, as I recall, mm -hmm. uh, which you would sort of. Convent, confidentially convey something to a designated officer who presumably knew how to handle this kind of stuff. So you weren't in the middle of something that you was beyond your ability really to, to, to know how to best uh, balance and manage. But it did seem to be a bit of a, you know, a difficult thing to get in the middle of. And I exactly. Feel. And what it really illustrates the fact that the federal regulations issued by the Trump administration said minimums. And if schools want to increase the number of, of mandatory reporters, want to tweak with the responsibilities of faculty, they can, they can do that. And I just add that uh, my wife's a psychologist, and psychologists have these very elaborate rules about when they have to report right. his conduct and when, they, when confidentiality um, applies. Um, and so they, they give an extensive training on this. And even then, the rules have difficult border areas. Um, but then to thrust on us who have no training on this and haven't really thought much about it is, um, I'm sure that most faculty members don't do a very good job at it. Yeah, interesting. Any other, I mean, just from the point of view of American government, institutions, politics, I mean, uh, unintended consequences, sort of the stuff we all studied in grad school with, with James Q. Wilson and others, what, what do you take from this long saga? I mean, what, what would you emphasize to students in your class about Amer what this tells us about American government today, the administrative state, that's such a sure. big topic and people talk about it. It seems like a very good instance of it. Yeah. 50 years ago, there was nothing. And then there's a one amendment passed and then we have a big infrastructure or superstructure or whatever the right way to say it is created, but maybe it's terrible. Maybe that's just the way the world, the world works. Maybe it's kind of inevitable. I don't, I don't know what the- I, I, Let me, I, a few generalizations. One is that despite, the extent to which we hear about gridlock and legislation not getting passed, which is often true, there are ways around that. Um, and this uh, kind of institutional leapfrogging through administration and courts um, is a good example of how policy can grow with Congress saying virtually nothing. Um, another feature is the extent way in which um, in, in many of these areas, the United States is much more aggressive than European countries. There have been studies of sexual harassment in Germany and the EU, um, and um, they are not nearly as extensive, and largely because of the role of the courts. Um, the courts are not nearly as active in European countries as they are here, um, and the, that they are more resistant to putting policies in terms of rights. So Marianne Glendon's arguments about rights talk really applies extremely, uh, extremely well here. Um, the other thing I would add is for all of the talk about the administrative state, this is not particularly administrative. Um, that the courts are key actors, um, that uh, the administrators um, obviously are important, but when they act unilaterally, um, they can be quickly overturned. 
Um, the presidents in the White House play a key role. Um, so to, um, to those who kind of complain about the deep state or the administrative state, while I've written about it, we have to realize that um, it is not nearly as powerful or as administrative as that term might indicate. Or as single-mindedness minded, perhaps, since this yes. has been competing pressures from different departments of education, I, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want to. Yeah. Don't want to it, it downplay the extent to which uh, the uh, Department of Education has been a crucial actor here, and I've been right. quite critical of the the way in which administrative has have expanded their power. But um, it's not as kind of, um, deep seated or as permanent or as seated in the executive branch as that term might indicate. And I suppose I'm now generally been inclined to be on the side of the critics of of, of the aggressive action, certainly by the administration, and more broadly, a little bit of a defender or nostal maybe nostalgic for the old colleges and universities. But I suppose one has to be, to be fair, one has to say, well, what's what would the, the alternative to this sprawling administrative apparatus with le legal apparatus, uh, what seems often to someone who walks in as I did to teach a course or something, excessive bureaucratic you know, structure and a lot too many people working in this area and pushing certain agendas sometimes. I mean, what's the, you know, you have to be concrete about, well, what, what would I prefer? What would one prefer if one were, would one really want to go back to no standards, no rep, no, no guidance for faculty on remedy, on what they could or couldn't do, no remedies, except uh, bringing literally a, a, if the administration ignored you, uh, bring a lawsuit, I mean, maybe that, well, maybe one would want to go back to that. I don't know, but I mean, that would, it is fair to say that uh, some of the criticism of this perhaps is, is sort of, doesn't quite come to grips with what the alternative is. So I guess the Trump administration did come to grips with it. It's funny that with all administrations, they seem to have tried to work out a kind of conventional, incremental conservative solution, mm -hmm. not a radical one. Is that right? I mean, right. You know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, when I've um, done some talk shows on Title IX, someone will always come on and say, well, shouldn't we just um, abolish Title IX? And I think the answer is obviously not. I mean, Title IX is, was one of the most successful laws ever passed by Congress. The, opening the doors of education to women you know, was just a tremendous success. Um, mm. And um, you know, there were some excesses in athletics and some excesses in sexual uh, misconduct. Some of those have been addressed. Um, but I think you're right. I, what I would say is that while this sounds boring and nerdy, Going through the notice and comment rulemaking process really helps because it allows you to, to identify problems, um, to deal with incremental change, um, to have public participation in ways that unilateral administrative action doesn't. Um, so I think that the more, I mean, this is a classic example of uh, forms and formalities that Tocqueville talked about. You go through the process, you go through the, uh, you respect the forms, and often the policy turns out to be better. And I think that's one of the lessons of the Trump rulemaking. I mean, who could be who could be worse to deal with the problem of sexual <laughs> harassment than an admitted sexual harasser, Donald Trump? Yet his administration turned out to be pretty good on this issue, much to my amazement. And finally, what is it? Perhaps finally, what does it tell you about? I'm curious what you think about liberalism and conservatism today. I mean, I yeah, I have a thought about conservatism, but I'll let you go first, especially about liberalism. I mean, the, is the balance of power on the kind of liberal due process, ACLU First Amendment side of things, or De Dean Strassen, I'm not even sure where the ACLU is institutionally on this these days, or is the balance of power on the left with, you know, the more radical types who do want to change the entire culture and therefore are willing to downplay, to say the least, concerns about um, due process and, and even freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, that, what's, one of the things that's particularly interesting about Title IX is those issues. Um, really are at the forefront. Uh, most obviously in the transgender issue that we haven't talked about, but um, that's uh, where it's played out most forcefully today. Now, I really do, I think that there is a major battle for the, basically for the soul, not only the country, but of the Democratic Party, of to what extent of these traditional liberal values, uh, freedom of speech, due process, that have been so important um, on, on the left are going to be thrown aside. Um, and I'm really, there are, are uh, people in the legal community, um, uh, women in uh, 
female professor at Harvard Law School who have really stood up and said that these traditional liberal values are really essential. Um, and I think they deserve a lot of praise, but they're facing a lot of pushback, especially among younger uh, people in law schools and colleges. Uh, and I think that's where the real battle lines um, are, are being fought out. And I could say the same on the conservative side, you know, there's the kind of, uh, some conservatives, my friend David French, I would say, right, to make this point, would say, look, the system, this is why we value courts, rights, liberties. We, we want a, a kind of liberal process here because it's, in this case, ended up helping conservatives probably against what the administrators would do if they were simply on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others who would say, well, this just shows how much everyone sold out. And we'll, yeah. we'll look at now we have these massive institutional uh, structures enforcing a kind of left wing people with a view of gender and mm -hmm. it all needs to be swept away. And, and so I, I think on both sides, there's interesting debates going ahead on this, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I just very briefly on the on the transgender yes, issue. Worried about that. Um, the about the, um, I, I, the Supreme Court's decision in the Bostock. Um, it, I thought that made a lot of sense. Um, they basically said that you can't deny employment to someone on the basis of transgender status um, because that's a matter of sex. Um, but what the court and this was an interpretation of an employment. Uh, this was not a university. Is that right? Or Right, exactly. It was a yeah. Title VII employment. What the court did not say, and I think that they uh, that they made a studious effort to try to avoid saying this, is that, um, say, a person who has uh, uh, now presents as female, that does not make that person for all purposes female, That is, um, which is the, the big issue today. Um, there were no issues about do they need to be considered a female for locker rooms, for dormitories, for sports teams? Um, so I thought I think that they walked a very careful line in that decision, saying we shouldn't uh, discriminate against people because of the way they pre the sexual presentation. But that doesn't mean that that person is inherently a member of the sex that they claim to be. So I think the court has been pretty pretty good on these issues. And the university doesn't therefore have an obligation necessarily to accommodate X, Y, yeah. or Z. It can't discriminate on the one hand. But right. Yeah. Right, so. right. yeah the, 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 one of the things the Trump administration did immediately was to, uh, uh, to withdraw the Dear Colleague letter on transgender rights. Basically because the Office for Civil Rights had said, you have to treat someone who's transitioned to be female in all respects as if they're female. Um, and, and, and the Biden administration hasn't restored that. Yeah, interestingly, they have not um, reinstated that. So I, there's, more, there's more caution there than I would have expected. I'll just say one of the interesting things, kind of the battles going on, is that the um, acting uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, um, I'm afraid I forgot her name, was, had been a Title IX uh, coordinator at Columbia. Seemed like a fairly thoughtful, experienced person, you know, uh, in, in line with the Biden administration. But she had been harshly attacked by survivor groups because she had found that um, a person accused of misconduct was not guilty of misconduct. So I think that the, the trying to find for the Biden administration, trying to find a middle ground between the extremes um, in a more politically acceptable position is a hard one for them. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to come back in a year or two years and see, uh, right. no, seriously, in a year, we're just yeah. see what they've done. It is a kind of such a fascinating uh, micro, not, not so micro, but you know, yeah. sort of case study, I guess, maybe is the right way to say it, of uh, American government and politics at work. Any final thoughts, things we've neglected or uh, lessons that you would stress to students, again, looking at government and the way it works? Um, uh, do you think this? Well, I'll ask this last question. I mean, do you think this Title IX university is sex? I mean, you, you could argue this is a pretty unique sort of sui generis thing, isn't characteristic of American government as a whole, uh, which has very different kinds of interest groups and different issues and more economics and less culture and so forth. Or is this, I mean, how characteristic if, if we went to 10 other cabinet agencies and looked at 10 other controversies about interpretations of 
laws that weren't intended to do certain things and they get interpreted in certain ways, clean air amendments instead of education amendments and so on. Mm -hmm. Would one see things that one would recognize from this case study? I think so. Um, my, my son is doing privacy law um, with healthcare. And he basically said that so much of the privacy regulation is based on a single sentence in the Federal Trade Commission Act hmm. um, that has been grown and grown and grown and grown. Um, I do think a, a point that you made along uh, several times is what's the nature of the opposition? Where's their pushback? And I think one thing that's unusual about uh, dealing with education is that uh, schools don't push back very much. Um, and I, what I would say is, uh, to some extent, most disturbing to me about the, these cases is the extent to which universities have been so incredibly gutless um, that they basically accepted whatever um, was thrown at them, often expanded upon it. Um, and I think it's time for universities in so many ways, this is just one example, in so many ways to stand up for traditional academic liberal values. And of course we see that almost everywhere these days. And that's the, I guess what I'm most worried about, certainly as a faculty member, um, but also as a citizen concerned about uh, the role of universities within the political system. But you don't think that, you think they could do that within the current context. The title yes. line is not an excuse for them not to do that, I guess is what you're saying. Exactly, right, yeah. And they basically, they should try, rather than, well, number one, hiding behind expansive interpretations of federal regulations um, uh, and not ever challenging them, um, they should say that, you know, that when there is a challenge to some basic liberal academic values, especially freedom of speech and inquiry, that's where they really need to draw the line. University of Chicago has, most universities haven't. Um, and I think that that's um, uh, really inexcusable. That's another topic, a related topic, right. but uh, another topic that we should discuss uh, also in the, in the, in the Sooner, maybe sooner than a year, but certainly at some point, and, and that we have discussed actually with others on, I've discussed with others on these conversations and you've discussed in other contexts as well. But Shab Malik, thank you very much for, for joining me. For, I think this really fascinating discussion, as I say, both fascinating in its own right, it's such a topic and important one, but also for what it, the light it sheds more broadly on sort of how, how the American government of politics works, which is not a, an important topic. <laughs> so well, it's great you. to have a chance to talk to you about these things. Yeah, I, thank really, you. I really enjoyed it. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.